but that 88 is pulling away. Earnhardt, Johnson, Menard, Blaney, third generation star, Dale Earnhardt Jr. Brings him to the flag, checkered flag, waving, it's over, it's Earnhardt. Earnhardt trying to cover all spots. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good job, June Buck. Woo. Dale Earnhardt Jr. Woo. Checkered flag at Talladega. Why is this one so much fun? Because your grin told so many stories on your cool down lap. It's just real emotional. I haven't won here in a long time. It's my daddy's birthday a couple days ago. It's just real emotional, man. Uh, my nerd world. And welcome to it for the My Nerd World Dale Earnhardt Jr. Race Preview Podcast. I am your host, John Justice, as we head to the Irish Hills of Michigan. And I feel like I say this on so many different podcasts, uh, but I'm going to say it again. I love this race. Uh, this is uh, this is a special race for me. This is one of my favorite tracks. I've had a chance to see several races uh, at Michigan International Speedway. It's one of the uh, tracks that I enjoy racing the most when I play NASCAR uh, 15. Speaking of which, I'm going to uh, comment briefly later on in the podcast about the Forza 6 uh, NASCAR expansion for the Xbox One. Uh, disappointed, really disappointed, actually. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later on if you are a, a gamer and haven't purchased it already. Maybe I'm not utilizing it correctly, which is uh, entirely possible. We'll obviously look back at Pocono so close last week. We'll talk a little bit about that. I want to get into a bit of the uh, merchandise that is uh, available. Not a lot this week, but we will talk a bit about that. Uh, we will also uh, mention Dale Earnhardt Jr. is going to be in the booth for the Xfinity race on Saturday. Really looking forward to not just watching that race, but to hear uh, Dale Jr. in the booth. Because I think that potentially, once Dale Jr. retires, which he hasn't given an indication that he's going to at least anytime soon, he'll probably end up in the broadcast booth, which I think would be a really uh, a really great uh, place for him. I could see him doing uh, as good, if not a, uh, a better job than... Uh, than Jeff Gordon. And of course, we'll preview Michigan. And look, I, I, I'm excited again. I really am. When I look at the factors that um, I sort of zero in on to make my race predictions, which arguably have sucked it this year, be that as it may, when I look at the factors of uh, how good is the car, uh, what's the team saying, what kind of attitude does Dale Earnhardt Jr. have currently, uh, what track are they racing at, <clears throat> and the momentum behind the team. Now, granted, it was just one race last week, but I, the reality is, well, we'll get into that. We'll get into that. But when I look at that car, team, driver, track, and momentum, um, I, I think that we've got a really, really, really good chance to win on Sunday in, uh, in Michigan. We obviously had a really, really good chance to win at Pocono. But there's a, there's a theme. There's, a, there, there's one thing that I want to that I want to focus on because it relates to the Pocono race last week and it also relates to the qualifying uh, that took place on Friday with Michigan because Dale Earnhardt Jr. qualified 25th, which took us all by surprise because the car was so fast in in qualifying trim on Friday for the first practice. The first practice, they, they did some race laps to see how fast the car was. And again, speaking of the car, it was fast off the truck. But when they put it in qualifying trim, he had a top four lap time. I really expected that Dale Jr. was going to be vying for the pole on Friday, and it just didn't happen. There's a reason for that, and this relates to what happened last week. I think, well, I don't think I know. And this is this is a carryover from doing my my weekly radio show, covering uh, controversies, uh, issues of the day, and stories. We live in a world where it's very easy to immediately go and put your opinion out on social network, and stories end up becoming bigger than they normally would be. I don't want to venture too far off of NASCAR, but I just want to make this example, make this point, and then relate it to. Pocono last week and qualifying this week. Okay, so for example, uh, did you the the story of the gorilla at the Cincinnati Zoo a couple of weeks ago that captured the attention of the of the planet? There was a gorilla, the seventeen year old gorilla in the Cincinnati Zoo. This uh, four year old kid fell uh, fell into the gorilla pit, 
and they ended up having to put the gorilla down to save the child. It caused all kinds of outrage and controversy. People saying that the uh, the parents should should uh, have their child taken away from them and should be charged and blah blah blah. Okay, so what's my point? My point is absence. Uh, absent the internet and social networking and the ability to put an opinion out there, that story ends up being uh, a uh, a non-lead story in mainstream media news. If you don't have people uh, that are able to comment on that story and give their opinion out in mass and have everybody hop on board and perpetuate this narrative, that story gets news coverage, but it, it becomes an afterthought. That's not to say that people don't care about what happens with the gorilla or the child, but it is to say without the internet perpetuating this controversy, people just generally accept, oh, okay, kid fell into a pit and they had to kill the uh, gorilla in order to save him and we all move on with life. Okay, so why do I bring this up? I bring this up because in circumstances like this now, everybody ends up becoming an expert. They become an expert on gorillas. They become an expert in parenting. They become an expert in zoo safety when they aren't any of those things. There is no taking into account all the other factors involved as it relates to how that story played out. So unless you're there, you don't know what really happened with that. Unless you were there and watched it all happen, you don't know what kind of mom this mom is. You don't know the circumstances that brought about that kid falling into the into the gorilla pit. You don't know the behind the scenes discussions that went on and the deliberations over whether or not they're supposed to kill they're supposed to go and kill that gorilla. So how could you possibly go and offer a a, a solid fact-based opinion off something where you just have the base level information. Now, it's okay to offer that opinion. We all have opinions, right? It's okay to do that. But I personally believe that there needs to be an understanding that if you're going to go and offer those opinions and your viewpoints on certain things, then there also needs to be, a, okay, but I also understand that I wasn't there. This is only based off of preliminary information. So why did I go off on this tangent on the NASCAR podcast? Here's why. Because so many people offer up, and I've done this, so I'm guilty of this. So many people have offered up opinions of Dale Jr. and this team based off of one race or what happened in a race without putting in all the different variables involved that may have affected what had happened. For example, Pocono last week, a lot of people talking about, well, the lack of speed in the car was what ended up costing Junior the race because Junior couldn't go and catch uh, Kurt Busch uh, during that race, and Hendrick Motorsports is off, and you, you just hear people making all these comments, all these negative comments, without really knowing all the variables. I'm going to provide some variables that maybe people don't think about, okay? Not because I'm special, but because I love NASCAR and Dale Jr., and I think about these things probably way more than I should. Same thing as it relates to qualifying. Unless you were watching qualifying, because I heard a lot of people that were on Twitter going, oh my gosh, this team is, I can't believe it. They pulled off a second place finish and now he qualified 25th. What's wrong? Oh, you know, get a new crew chief. And I, it's like, look, unless you were watching and you know all the factors, you know, back off a little bit. Cut a little bit of slack to the driver. I'm not saying you're not allowed to have your opinion, but maybe as junior fans, we would be better off um, waiting a little bit before we just did a knee-jerk reaction and decided to switch Dale Jr.'s crew chief, uh, you know, a crew chief out based off of one practice session. Look, last week at Pocono, we re we were really close to winning that race. That car was not that fast, though. I watched that whole race from well, actually, that's interesting because I didn't get a chance to. Uh, I I followed it because of the rain delay to Monday, so I actually followed the race during my radio show <laughs> and then uh and then paid attention to it on the drive home and got home and was able to watch the second half of it live there were a lot of different things involved that brought about that second place finish okay the car was not that fast it was fast but it wasn't that fast clean air meant a lot dale earnhardt jr was correct when he went and said after the race, that he should not have let Kurt Busch by on that final restart. He should have pressed him harder because he probably could have driven away. The other big variable in this, because I was watching really closely in those, in those final 20 laps, which is a long way of Pocono. 
you know, Greg Ives told Junior that he could go for it. He was good on gas. But Dale Jr. was also aware that Greg Ives told him that the 41 car of Kurt Busch was not good on fuel, and they pitted really close to each other. I'm convinced that subconsciously or on a conscious level, Dale Jr. was backing off a little bit and wasn't wasn't pushing the car that hard. I believe, even though J- Dale Jr. didn't come out and say it, I believe that Dale Jr. was thinking, oh, man, I can really go for this and perhaps pull off a win, but if I run out of gas and we have another bad finish, that's going to be worse. What's the better outcome here? Risking the win, which you would think the way this chase is set up, where wins matter so much, would be the deciding factor. Or making sure that they get themselves a good finish. I think for Dale Jr., and I would agree with this if this was his mentality, for Pocono, it was better that that team got a good finish than to have gone for the win, ran the car out of gas, and finished you know, outside the top 15. That would have been devastating. I'd rather come off that race at Pocono having almost won, logging a, a solid second-place finish, fighting off Brad Keselowski, who arguably had the fastest car on the track those closing laps, and using that momentum carrying into Michigan this weekend. So, you know, as it relates to the naysayers and the complainers last week, you got to put those variables in, you know, out there. You got to think beyond just flat out speed of the car uh, restarts. And you got to, you, in, in my opinion, you got to look a little deeper into what exactly it must feel like being in the car. And look, I'll just use dumb personal experience because it is dumb. When I'm doing my NASCAR race on on, on my Xbox 360 for NASCAR 15, you know, I I, I think the same way when I'm looking at a, at a fuel mileage race and. Trying to make those, <clears throat> trying to make those decisions. Now, again, that's a really, really bad example because that's not, you know, close to race conditions. But it's as close as you know this forty-three-year-old NASCAR fan is is going to end up getting to race conditions. So when you look at what happened at Pocono, and we'll talk a bit about, I'm sorry, at uh, Michigan for qualifying, and then we're going to go back and talk a little merchandise, and then we'll get into uh, to Michigan and my prediction for the race. But when you look at qualifying on Friday, unless you were watching, you don't really know what happened. Dale Jr. tweeted out that. The track had changed from that first practice, which was early in the day, to qualifying, which was much later in the day. When they drove that first lap, the tail of the car was really, really loose. It was clear. Like, I'm watching, or I just got done watching uh, practice uh, for uh, on, on Fox for today's race. And you watch Dale Jr. through the corners during practice on fresh tires, which I just did, compared to what he looked like sawing on the wheel during qualifying Friday, it's night and day. It was smooth during practice right now on fresh tires. When you watched him during qualifying, he was sawing on that thing. And they put up a decent lap, but you know what? That first lap in qualifying was a second off of what he ran in qualifying practice, in qualifying trim. It was good enough to... to move on to the next round, and I fully expected that they were going to make some air pressure changes because that's about all you can do in practice. I'm sorry, in qualifying. I was fully convinced that they were going to make some air pressure changes, but unfortunately, there was a cloud, or basically a, a, a series of clouds came over and ended up shading the track, and because of that, a bunch of guys went out and ran some wicked lap, uh, you know, wicked fast lap times. You know, Dale Jr. went out again and tried to run again, but just couldn't put the uh, couldn't put the lap together. That second lap he ran, I just I just think he screwed up. I think he would have had the opportunity to get in and move on, but he really kind of messed up that second lap. So Friday's qualifying was not really about the car being slow. It was about all the other variables surrounding it. He was a victim of really, really bad circumstances. Unfortunately, when you look at the way they've qualified all year and the narrative that has been dogging this team as it relates to qualifying, it's very easy to go and say, oh, another poor qualifying effort. Granted, it was a poor qualifying effort, but it wasn't a poor qualifying effort because the car was slow. It was a poor qualifying effort because of the circumstances involved. 
They didn't expect the tr-